All right, good morning. My name is Mary Leonard. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, this week's Grand Rounds is very special in many ways, as you will hear in a moment. Um, but before we start, I just want to call your attention to our opening slide with our land acknowledgement, as well as the information about CME and MOC credit. And then looking ahead, we always use this opportunity to make sure people know what's coming up next. And next week, we're going to hear from Edward Barksdale. Edward is the um, Division Chief of Pediatric General and Thoracic Surgery um, at Rainbow Babies. And the title, An Unbreakable Contract, A New Paradigm for Academic Surgery, last night as I was just reviewing these slides, I thought, that sounds interesting. And I went online and I read about him and I watched some of his YouTube videos. Um, he does quite extraordinary work about physicians and our social contract and very much around uh, justice and health equity. And it's just going to be an extraordinary lecture. So really encourage all of you to join us. And then the following week on Thursday, this is a special Thursday series. Bonnie's going to give us an update on COVID and children. Bonnie Maldonado, I'm sure you all know. Um, she's a person who's really, uh, Paul King, our CEO, likened her to Beyonce, is somebody who we all know on a first name basis because she is our, our person, our thought leader in everything COVID and, you know, president, you know, head chairs the American Academy of Pediatrics Infectious Disease Committee and the Red Book and many things. So during the height of the pandemic, we were getting Thursday updates from Bonnie. And so we decided it was time to get another one of those. So make a note of that as well. Um, the Biodesign Faculty Fellows is going to be the topic for the upcoming MCHRI seminar series. So the Maternal and Child Health Research Institute has monthly seminar series to learn about things going on around the School of Medicine and across campus. And this one on April 10th is going to be the Biodesign Faculty Fellows presentation. And then very importantly, make sure everybody is getting all excited for our annual, our 14th annual uh, pediatrics research retreat. I want to thank the coordinating committee this year, the program committee. Um, every year we think about new ways to have more engagement, especially a real emphasis on our young folks and our trainees. Um, and this, you'll see a nice representation of disciplines and then any, everywhere from our fellows to senior faculty uh, who are going to be presenting. And then especially the roundtable discussion topics on what can your department, what can the Department of Pediatrics do for you? So I really hope, really hope you'll all join us that day. Um, and then I was walking through the Center for Academic Medicine and I was seeing rotating slides for upcoming talks through the Dunleavy Center, the whole um, maternal fetal medicine program. And the talks looked incredible. And I said, send us your slides so I can show them at pediatric grand rounds. I think people will be really interested to know more about that uh, conference that's gonna be happening on Friday, April 21st in the afternoon. Um, and with that, I'm going to transition and ask Dr. Barbara Sorks to come present today's speaker for our very special endowed lectureship. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you, Mary, and <clears throat> welcome everyone out in cyberspace and in the room. Um, welcome to our 10th Ben Ephraim Family Lecture in Pediatric Palliative Care. First and foremost, I want to thank the Ben Ephraim family for their generosity and devotion to our palliative care program. Bina and Gideon Ben-Ephraim established this lectureship in 2006, and over the years, they've included the next generation of their family. Their gift has given us the opportunity to bring luminary speakers, national and international leaders in the field to Packard. We have a slide here, um, thank you to the staff who made it for me, of our 10 speakers, including Blythe Lord today. And for those of you who know the field, you realize that these are many of the pioneers in pediatric palliative care. Um, and true to the ethic, it's an interdisciplinary group. There are physicians, nurse, anthropologists, psychologists, and then today I'll introduce our, our very interdisciplinary guest, Blythe Lord. But our gratitude to the Ben Ephraim family is really ongoing and very deep. Thank you. So today it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Blythe Lord. Ms. Lord is the founder and executive director of Courageous Parents Network, a nonprofit platform that contains more than 600 videos, podcasts, and printed materials, all designed to educate and empower parents who are caring for children with serious illness. Blythe's middle daughter, Cameron, died of Tay-Sachs disease in 2001 at the age of two. Out of this experience came her commitment to help other families facing similar extraordinary challenges. 
both her educational background from Yale and Harvard and her 20 year professional career in television production, working for ABC and WGBH Boston, gave her the foundation to produce the award-winning film, Cameron's Ark, Creating a Full Life with the American Academy of Pediatrics. The film educates primary pediatricians in working with families from the time of their child's diagnosis through to the child's death. The establishment of Courageous Parents Network was Blythe's next step, and it's an ongoing step, as you will hear. Blythe has been recognized in many ways for her unique contributions to the field. Among many honors, she's the only parent member of the Executive Committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics Section on Palliative Medicine. And in 2021, she received the Presidential Citation for Palliative Care Advocacy from the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. Blythe's work embodies creativity of the mind, heart, and soul. The interweaving of her creativity with her wisdom and sensitivity has opened new horizons of understanding for seriously ill children, families, and for the clinicians who care for them. And in Blythe's words, and this is a quote, you work in the hope space and you tend to the grief. Such is the essence of palliative care. And with her own words, I will now welcome Blythe. And imagine getting an introduction more generous than that. Um, hello, everybody. It is a real honor to be here uh, I will, for a lot of reasons. I mean, superficially, I've never been to Stanford before, so that's pretty neat and fun for me. Uh, we had a wonderful tour of Palo Alto yesterday. Harvey and Barbara gave me a tour. Um, and also, it is always a privilege to come and talk about something that is very, very important to me and to have people who wish to listen. Um, I am here first and foremost in my capacity as a parent, actually. Uh, I have, uh, I've shown, I've chosen these three photos of me to uh, illustrate my evolution. <laughs> um, the first is me with my daughter, Cameron, uh, that was taken in two, that was probably taken in 2000. Um, and then that's my headshot, my first headshot for Courageous Parents Network. And then during the pandemic, I decided to stop coloring my hair. So I needed one that more accurately represented what I look like now. Um, but my sister opined the other day that that headshot with the wind whipping my hair across my face was not appropriate for a talk about caring for seriously ill children. <laughs> it's a little too breezy, she thought. So I'm in the market for a new headshot. Um, here are the objectives for today. You can, you're all very smart, so you can read those very quickly. Um, this photo captures images. Uh, it reflects images of parents that we have worked with at Courageous Parents Network. And if you could just take a moment to look at these photographs of parents with their children and wonder for yourself what they might be thinking I was one of those parents. Um, all of those parents are caring for children living with medical complexity and serious illness. And that was me. Um, my daughter, Cameron, is there in the middle. Uh, and my nephew, Hayden, I'm going to briefly tell you this story because it's not typical and it's actually very important to the origin of the work that I do. Um, my husband is an identical twin who um, and his identical twin, Tim, my his name is Charlie. Um, Charlie's identical twin, Tim, who's there in the blue jacket, married my roommate from college, Allison. They're in the yellowy neon jacket. They started dating right after, right before we got married. So it wasn't too ridiculous. Um, and um, their first son, Hayden, there in red at the age of one was inaccurately diagnosed with cerebral palsy. He wasn't hitting developmental milestones and they took him to the doctor and they said, your son has cerebral palsy. Uh, at that moment, my daughter Cameron was born. Uh, my second daughter, my older daughter was two and Cameron was born. And so for five months, we were living with my, my husband and I had two healthy, typical children. Tim and Allison had Hayden with cerebral palsy. 
Um, and we really wrapped our minds around that. And we did, we're doing everything possible to help him with OT and PT. We spent holidays together and we all did the exercises with Hayden to help maximize his strength and his motor skills. Um, and we were all, you know, we'd made peace with the giving, you know, Hayden would grow up with cerebral palsy and we would be as good as possible. It would be good. Um, but then Hayden started to the OT and PT people who were working with Hayden said, we don't think this is cerebral palsy because he's losing skills. And um, at that point, Tim and Allison, my brother and sister-in-law took him in and he was this time seen by an ophthalmologist who saw the cherry red spots and accurately diagnosed Hayden as having infantile Tay-Sachs disease, which is still, so this was in 1999. It is still fatal in um, there is no treatment or cure for Tay-Sachs. There are clinical trials underway, but we have a long way to go. And because my husband's a twin, I assumed that he was a carrier. I knew that my grandmother was of Ashkenazi um, descent. It was possible that I carried the mutation that they had seen before. I went and got tested. The geneticist at the Brigham in Boston said, it's so statistically improbable that all four of you would be carriers. This is, I'm quite certain you probably aren't. It came back that I was. She said, hopefully that's a false positive. We'll go get Cameron tested. Cameron's tested, came back. Her, the enzyme level in her blood was such that she was clearly, um, there was very little hex A in her blood. And they said, in fact, she is, um, she also has Tay-Sachs. So within two weeks, we found out these four parents six grandparents and four parents um, found out that these two beautiful, seemingly healthy looking children were going to die in early childhood. And that incredibly difficult thing that we had to do, the four of us, was made possible because we did it together, the four of us. We traveled that road with decision-making conversations about our goals of care, where did, did we want to have the feeding tube? We all opted, the four parents, we could have made different decisions, but we the, four, the two couples decided we would not have feeding tubes for our children because the neurodegenerative decline was and devastation is so utterly complete with Tay-Sachs. We felt that, that we did not want to prolong their lives with artificial nutrition when they could no longer swallow. Um, and we learned from Hayden, who was a year older, that hospitalizations for children, pneumonia is a very common thing that happens when they aspirate, and that um, aspirate that hospitalization is a brutal experience for children who startle easily, which is one of the um, symptoms of Tay-Sachs. So after Hayden's first hospitalization, we swore, my husband and I, never to hospitalize Cameron. Um, and we had an amazing primary care pediatrician named Dr. Richard Goldstein in primary practice, community practice in Cambridge, who made it possible to keep Cameron at home all the way through her two years. Um, she had multiple pneumonias. He kept her, he treated her pneumonia at home. I mean, he, we brought her in, he gave her the things, we treated her at home. And then when we transitioned to end of life after her final pneumonia that we decided not to treat, he agreed as a primary care pediatrician not to treat her last pneumonia. And he helped keep her comfortable. He brought in a, an expert in pain management for children at end of life to help keep Cameron comfortable and tell our nurses who are not hospice nurses how to keep Cameron comfortable. And Cameron was able to die peacefully four days after her birthday, um, the second birthday. The other thing that's important to this story is that Hayden had died five months prior to Cameron's death. And my husband was there at Hayden's bedside and was able to tell me what end of life looked like. And he was able to reassure me that we could do this extremely difficult thing. And um, and then I was able to see my brother and sister-in-law and see that they were still standing. And I mean, I talk about this, <laughs> I sort of fixated on the fact that they had clean hair. And I was like, wow, they shower. Like, these are the things you can't imagine you can go on after the death of your child. And my brother and sister-in-law were evidence that they could. So I wanted to do for other parents caring for seriously ill children what had been done for my husband and me, which was promote the value of, pal promote the value of palliative care, 
um, promote the importance of uh, grief counseling, because I didn't mention that, but we had a phenomenal pediatric psychologist who we worked with from diagnosis onwards, and to bring them into community with other parents like them. We'll see some of Courageous Parents Network in a minute, but here, um, what I learned and what we continue to learn is that these core principles, uh, and this is what you, I sort of the invisible look, the invisible things, the thought bubbles, I think that would be going over the parents we saw on that first slide when they're looking at their children. Parents want to feel that they are being the very, very best parents they can possibly be. They hope that they are doing right by their child, that they are there for their child, that they are being a good advocate, that they are not allowing suffering and that they are making, helping their child be as healthy as possible for as long as possible. This probably will be familiar to many of you. It originates in the work of Dr. Pamela Hines, uh, who was one of your previous speakers. When I was starting Courageous Parents Network, I was looking for research that would affirm my conviction that this is what parents want, that I wanted to bring this to parents going through it. And I had, a, you know, we're a nonprofit. I was trying to fundraise and I had a finance guy say, what's your proof? What's your data? And um, I, so I was like, oh God. So I went to the library and I was researching, researching, and I came upon this 2009 study from Dr. Hines and I just was all in. I was like, this resonates with me 100%. Um, I just absolutely loved it. And it comes, the notion of the, being a good parent, for those of you who don't know, is does not imply that there's such a thing as a bad parent. It originated from parents. Parents are the ones who came up with the term good parent, not clinicians. And it encompasses all the ways that parents want to feel that they are showing up, caring for, loving their child. Um, since 2009, Dr. Hines and others have extended the research and then looks at Tessie October um, did ex additional work with families in the ICU. Um, and then most recently, Dr. Megan Weaver, as well as um, Courageous Parents Network and Dr. Hines published, did more research with parents on called Honoring the Good Parent Intentions. So what gets in the way of parents feeling that they can be the best parent that they can possibly be for their child in the context of caring for a seriously ill children, child? Um, I want to highlight here so, some of the things that we know and believe and have learned in our work uh, about the inner psychosocial and emotional landscape of parents of seriously ill children. First, this following diagnosis or a shift in baseline and things that can't be this feeling that things aren't getting fixed is this feeling of helplessness and a lack of control and a pressure to be in control. Now, any of us who are, I mean, this is a natural state of the human condition. We want to feel that we're in control and that the feeling of helplessness is a, is nobody likes that, but anyone in this room who is a parent, recognizes that you want to have some feel like you have some agency over your child's life, where they go to school, how well fed they are, where they live, where their friend group is, their well-being. And illness just blows all of that out of the water because biology has a way of trumping parental parental um, control. Crazy thing. Um, parents also worry that their child's quality of life is misunderstood. They do the they meaning clinicians don't see what my child is like at home. They don't see the smiles that happen at home when they're surrounded by their siblings and their pets and the comfort of all the things that they love. They don't see that his lip turns up when he likes something. Parents also worry that they, the parents, either are misunderstood or will be under, misunderstood. If I advocate for my child or push back, it will alienate the team. If I show emotion, I may be construed of as perceived of as an angry parent. They might decide to call security on me. We know that's particularly true for parents of color. Um, and they don't understand that this emotion is just my fear. Or crying will make me appear weak. Parents also have a fear of failing their child. This couple, Sarah and, um, Sarah and Steve with their daughter, Emerson, in one of our interviews for CPN, they said, 
after they got her diagnosis with of Gaucher type two, which is still devastating and incurable. They said, we felt like we had to show, tell her, we had to show up and let her know she picked the right parents. These are the things that parents in this situation think. That was so true for me. I was like, okay, Cameron, we got to do right by you. You, you. You've got the parents for this. Um, so this is to summarize. Um, they're also in that last item is the one, this feeling of guilt. Now that's in we so many things. Guilt is an irrational emotion, um, but parents feel it. My genes, my guilt. I, I actually did not feel guilty. I didn't know I was a carrier of Tay-Sachs. I didn't know my husband was a carrier of Tay-Sachs. So I had no guilt, but I know that we know that for a lot of parents, even though it's completely irrational, guilt is part of the equation and, and guilt if they feel like they can't keep their child safe. So there are the desires to be a good parent. Some other invisible burdens that parents, your patient's parents may be carrying are the trauma that preceded your first meeting them. The diagnostic odyssey for many is very, very traumatic. Um, symptoms that they've been seeing for a while, fear and anxiety being um, dismissed by clinicians. A lot of primary care pediatricians don't recognize some of the early symptoms and will dismiss, dismiss neurotic and anxious, over-controlling, overbearing parent when often, in fact, something really is going on there. Parents um, also experience anticipatory grief from diagnosis onwards, all the, the loss, the things that are not going to be for their child. Um, fear of regret is a big, big thing. And then there's this notion, this concept of decisional fatigue, um, especially for children who have long indefinite timelines with a lot of medical complexity. Parents are having to make decisions all the time. And it is absolutely exhausting. Um, so I'm looking, what role can you, as the clinicians that you are, play in fostering good parent beliefs? Uh, I, this is, uh, the term centering the good actually came to me from one of your own, Dr. Jory Bogetz. She and I were working on some stuff together and she used the term centering the good. And I was like, oh my God, Jory, I love that so much. I mean, we were riffing off of the good parent work and I was like, yes, that's what it is. Helping parents center the good. So Jory should have a credit up on this slide. Um, so how, you know, in the face of guilt or powerlessness over what is out of their control, what can you do? Well, you can redirect their sense of agency. Um, in the law, the absence of feeling pride and comfort in what's going on, you can help them focus on what is working and what is true. Um, this is an article that was published in August of last year in Pediatrics. Um, Julie Hauer, Jory Bogetz, and a mother, Liv, Liz Morris, her son Colson, was cared for by Jory up in Seattle. He had mitochondrial disease and um, died at the age of four. And they co-authored this piece in Pediatrics, which I really recommend. Um, it's called Asset-Based Healthcare for Children with SNI. And they identify these five um, things that clinicians can do to help parents center the good. Recognize the parent as the expert in their child. Celebrate little things as wins. How many smiles has your child had in the past week? You know, keeping your child out of the hospital, that's a huge win. Um, uh, Liz talked about in the article, she talks about how when she arrived at the hospital after a couple of months of not being in the hospital, she felt devastated that they were actually in the hospital. I'm a god, I, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe I didn't bring him yesterday. I, I probably should have brought him yesterday. And the palliative care clinician said to her, Yes, but look at how long you he hasn't been in the hospital for. We've done such an amazing job keeping him out of the hospital. And now he needs to be here. And you're such a good mom. You got him here where he needs to be. Um, helping the parents see the positive outcomes of their caregiving. Uh, focusing on their hopes. And hopes can be little as well as big. And then supporting the parents and families to live in a meaningful present while not denying that there is a difficult or likely difficult future ahead. Uh, so 
in the work that Courageous Parents Network did with uh, Dr. Hines and Me Megan Weber in 2020, uh, they interviewed parents or they did a qualitative survey of courageous parents about um, the role of clinicians in fostering good parent beliefs. And I love the work, the findings that came out of it. None of it is earth shattering. It's basically just good care, but research speaks volumes, especially in medicine. And I think that these things I believe these things bear repeating again and again and again. So in green, the, four, the three most important things you can do to help foster parents, good, their good parent beliefs, or you can acknowledge their role in caring for their child, including them as a valued part of the team, trusting their judgment, talking openly, honestly, and clearly using clear language, not technical stuff, not vague, vague terms because understandably, but not helpfully, you are avoiding talking about difficult things. Parents don't do vague. They don't like it. They, they hear the avoidance in your language. It makes them anxious. Sometimes it makes them angry. It is never helpful. Um, you can communicate as in kind and caring ways. Um, that includes validation and encouragement and reassurance. And also, really, really seeing their child. That can be coming into the room and before you talk to them, you go to the child, you sit at their eye level, you acknowledge them, um, and then you pivot and turn your attention to the parent in the room, seeing the child beyond their medical condition, asking and being curious about who is this child at home? What are they like? What are their interests? What makes them happy? What soothes them? Um, talking, of course, about what their goals of care and quality of life are, what, what makes for a good day for this child in your family, um, and always, always, of course, listening. So um, one of the things I know from, from talking to you, I spend, is one of the greatest privileges of my, this work is to spend time talking to clinicians, which was not actually something I anticipated when I started Courageous Parents Network. I thought it was just gonna be talking to families, but happily it also involves um, talking to clinicians and largely um, clinicians who care for children with medical complexity, certainly palliative care, um, complex care, um, as well as hospice and bereavement specialists and doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains. And one of the things that I hear coming up a lot, understandably for you guys, is how do you do all of that if you are struggling with what the parent, if you disagree or have an issue with the decision-making that the parent is doing, the decisions the parent is making on behalf of their child, or the parent's belief in what they think is likely to happen or the parents hope for what they think will happen when you think it's going to turn out differently or you think that that, that um, health care, that that medical that decision about an intervention, whether it's to do something or not to do something, is not in the best interest of the child. Um, obviously, healthy communication, lots of conversations about goals of care, providing information to the parent, listening to them, bringing in colleagues to have conversations, never to change the parent's mind, that's not the goal, but to make sure that they are as informed as possible, as well as possible, so that you feel like they are make they have the information that you want them to have to make the best decision that is theirs to make for their child. And sometimes they're going to end up in a different place than you. And what do you do with that? And how do you align with the parents in that moment? And uh, and I think that's notion of alignment, is, which is not a foreign one to you, I'm sure, is a really powerful one. It's a great word, I think. Um, and in this book, Shared Struggles, which is a collection of essays by physicians who've cared for seriously ill children and parents who've cared for seriously ill children, uh, there, uh, the editor, co-editors is a mother, Ann Schruten, and the doctor, Barry Markowitz from um, Children's LA. And they write, a, they sort of write essays after the essays, reflecting on what they've read. I, I strongly recommend this book. 
And in one of them, Dr. Markowitz has just is writing an essay, reflection on this essay by a doctor who talks about how she really struggled with the decision that these parents were making on behalf of their child. Really, really, really struggled. And the work she had to do to get to accompany them and be alongside them as their ally and be in a you know constructive relationship with them. And he wrote, even as the doctor did not believe in the child's recovery as the, as the parents did, she believed in the parents. And I just like, there it is, right? Like you just pivot your attention to the love that is between the parent and the child, the parental conviction that they will do everything to be the best parent that they can be for their child. So what, what that looks like in that moment is, is you, you know, explore that, be curious about that, um, and then support that as best you can, because what you're doing is supporting the loving relationship between the parent and the child, not necessarily the medical outcome that you want. All right, I'm now going to stop talking and allow the parents of Courageous Parents Network to talk. I have chosen these... Um, because I just think they do a beautiful job of representing what parent love looks like and, um, and what good parent beliefs look like. Earlier on, <laughs> um, I was a bit of a, you know, you, when, when things are new to you, it's, it's like going into a new job, you're nervous. These people have been working here and doing this longer than you. So you, you kind of feel like, they 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 have more experience than I do. They know what they're doing, um, but that's not always true. Um, and you know, even with doctors and nurses at the hospital, just because they went to school for it, it doesn't mean that they know what they're doing all the way around the board. So I, I was at first uh, about a week in, I was like, you know, making letting them, uh, you know, tell me things, and then. After a week, I'm like, okay, enough is enough. Okay, you're this is my child. You're not gonna come in here and talk to me like you're better than I am because you have a degree for this. I'm her mother, okay? I'm her mother, I'm her father, I'm her doctor, I'm her nurse, I am her everything, okay? And you can't go to school for that. So I've had a few, you know, try to talk, talk, um, at me instead of to me and so it's like you get to a point where you kind of get pissed off and you're like okay enough is enough and now i see how i gotta conduct myself and how i have to handle this situation so that was the turning point for me like um when when you you're, you're tired of the technical terms and and medical terms and you know instead of them thinking, okay, well, this person doesn't notice these terms. So I'm going to break this thing down for them. So I, I, I got pissed off and I was like, okay, well, enough is enough. This is how we're going to do it. I tried it your way. Now you all are going to do it my way. Did you get pushback? Uh, yeah. Yeah, a couple of times, but uh, we're pretty well known around Shoah now. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't ask for a whole lot. I'm, all I ask for is respect, you know? And if you can't give me that, we have a serious problem. So uh, everybody there knows now, if we do have to go to the hospital, that's Miss House, that's Sydney House. Sweet, they, they just know like I'm, I'm just sweet. They call me sunshine when I come, okay? And Sydney's the diva. So a lot of people know that when I come and when we come, it's, it's nothing but love. If she goes off or says something, it's because someone pushed her to that point. Okay, so they go ahead and address it. And it's like they go ahead and prepare the new staff for me, you know? Yeah. Crystal's amazing. Sydney's a very lucky girl to have Crystal as her mom and her advocate. Uh, the, the next is. Um, so another thing that you can do to help parents um, is to alleviate some of the burden of decision-making. And that includes 
Uh, we've talked about using language that is concrete, giving them information, and also being as, as concrete as you can be with prognostic awareness and anticipatory guidance. Parents need you, you're the, you're the doctors, the nurses, the advanced practice clinicians who, who understand the likely progression of this disease or these conditions or likely outcomes. They want that information, you know, not all at once, but in a, in a manageable, at a manageable pace. Um, and this, we talk about shared decision-making in medicine, especially in palliative care. Um, and it's, it's, it's an art, right? It, 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 that what does share mean? It means different things in different instances. Sometimes it means you lead. Sometimes it means you follow, but you are doing that together. And um, when it's done well, it just makes all the difference in the world. And when it isn't, when parents feel like all of the burden is being put on them, and they're sort of being watched and everyone is just, here's the information. Now you decide it's not helpful at all. Um, and it, I recognize that it's an art. This is a couple there, um, Ashley and Theron, their son Vigo was born with a very, very rare con genetic condition. He lived most of his short life in the NICU. And it was only when palliative care was introduced that they were told that they could take their son home. They didn't know what they were supposed to be doing for the first few months of his life. And it was um, because the NICU people were not speaking clearly with them about what might happen. And the upshot of which was they felt like they had to stay in the hospital. And then when palliative care was finally introduced, they learned that they could take him home, which is what they did. Um, he ultimately came back to the hospital for an emergency and it was there that he died. But you know, they're very pleased they're, you know, they, they got to bring him home for much for part of his life. And then he went for the bronchoscopy. And that's when we got with when the each ENT surgeon came to tell us um, that they were going to take him for a bronchoscopy that he said, while we're in there, while he's intubated, we could just pop a trach in if we see a, a reason for it. No, if we see a need for it. You referred to pop a trach in. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like that was one of the first nobody had really said your baby might need a trach or even what a trach means i mean i tried to have a conversation with one of the nurses about it and she's like first of all the reactions were all like mm, you know and then she said well maybe it would just be like a trach but not a vented trach and i was like wait what does that mean what is the difference so of course all this information is trickling in sort of backwards and yeah. we are being offered to pop a trach in when we don't know what a trach is, what it means, what are the dangers, what are the advantages, disadvantages, what is vent versus not vent. So long well, story short, I said, I said, no, um, just tell us, do the bronchoscopy. And this, this seems like a very big, big decision that we're going to have to make later when we have gathered all the information. And, um, and the other thing that was at the same time, very frustrating for us is that all of these subspecialties would come in, say their little piece, and we would ask them questions and they would say, well, that's, that's really a question for, you know, neuro, or that's really a question for uh, peed surge. And, you know, everybody was punting to the other person. And we're, we're sitting there feeling like we can never leave this room because we're the only ones who are actually getting all of the information. Like we're the hub of information yeah. and we don't know anything about like this type of met, any of these subspecialties or spe like, how is this possible? So how did we first hear about? Well, part, when they came back with the bronchoscopy um, outcome, which was, which is just not good. It was like, he would, he would um, likely need a vented trach. That's, that's whenever we wanted to have a care conference and my mother thank god is um a retired nurse also a hospital administrator um and she she has been with a lot of people when they die and she feel she knows bad outcomes and she knows good outcomes and she became 
a very fierce advocate for us and for Vigo. And she sort of helped us think through like, okay, you want a care conference because you want everybody in the room. You don't want anybody to be able to punt to somebody else. Everybody needs to be in the same room and you need to have a palliative care consult, you know, and we started asking everybody who came in the room. We said, we want to talk to palliative care. We want to talk, we want to have a care conference. And that was also, didn't happen. It, it, we almost, there was a lot of resistance to that. You know, it sort of felt like, well, we're not at the palliative care place yet. I'm like, I'm not saying we're all going to die right now. I'm just saying, can I talk to them? Can we have a consult? You know, why do I have to request this 17 times in order to get someone from the palliative care team to come into my room of my child who is has a poor prognosis, whatever that means? I think that that's why, you know, Ashley brought up the trach issue because that was the first um, decision that we faced in terms of like, what road are there roads are there different paths what path are we choosing why are we choosing it right what what, what is the outcome like and and then also the different specialists as well it, it is feel as if um sometimes these medical professionals and doctors are like mechanics and they're like i work on this part of the vehicle and then another person works on this part of the vehicle but nobody like is someone who looks at the whole vehicle and it says, well, what is this vehicle driving for? What what sort of experience is the vehicle having? You know, <laughs> um, everybody yeah. just wants to fix something. Nobody wants to actually think about like, what is what is this person's actual experience? You know, like if if I'm gonna live like eighty years. So, yeah, the car mechanic analogy is not a bad one. Um, you guys. This happened less than a year ago at a major children's hospital in this country. This is not from like 10, 20 years ago before palliative care. This happened in a hospital that has a palliative care team. And so if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere. And it's just unnecessary. And I'm, um, uh, and it, anyway, I think you understand. Um, the uh, Ashley and Theron, Ashley, Ashley's become a blogger for Courageous Parents Network, and she recently published, we recently published this blog that she wrote um, where she provides a, a framework for tenants for decision making when a cure is not possible. And I just love this so much. I just want to highlight them. Um, our framework was to take into account the cost of every intervention and weigh that against our son's subjective experience with the goal that he feels safe, loved, and comfortable as much as absolutely possible. To recognize that critical care interventions can prolong death as well as sustain life, and that the distinction between the two is not always clear, and to ensure that our son's eventual death was peaceful in our loving arms. And I just, you know, if I feel like for other parents who are in this situation, these principles will be tremendously helpful. And I might suggest that you could consider them when you're working with a family and say a family has shared these values for decision making. Perhaps they would be helpful for you, too, when a cure is not possible. I'm going to skip this. Um, Courageous Parents Network has a lot of content also by clinicians because you guys are amazing that provide guidance and frameworks for decision making and thinking about not what what decision to make, but just how to think about what your values and goals are as a parent um, and how palliative care can help. But just also a lot of them, some of them are subspecialists um, who have either been trained in palliative care or are palliative minded. And they there's so much good stuff on there about them talking, but I'm not going to do that right now in the interest of time. Um, and uh, oh, this is another mom wrote a blog for CPN. Her daughter, Cassie, had I think she was about 16 years old and she was having to make a decision about whether Cassie would have um, sp spinal fusion surgery and um, a palliative care nurse said to her, 
How do you think Cassie feels about being here and all the interventions that she is experiencing? And the mom said, with that one question, she began to reevaluate what she thought being a good parent was. Because what previous, what precedes this in the blog post is she thought being a good parent was getting Cassie to all of her appointments and making sure she was getting all of her OT and PT and blah, blah, blah. Of course, that counts as good parenting. But this was also a new way of looking at it. How, what is it like for your daughter to be in her body? You, mom, are over here making all these decisions on her behalf. Cassie was neurologically impaired and not in a position to make her own decisions. And mom had never thought about what is it like for Cassie to be in her body. Um, Courageous Parents Network, I hope you will go look at it. I hope you will join. Um, see that little blue button up there? You click on it, you tell us your first name, last name, your email, where you work, what your position is. Um, you will then be a member. You will have access to the clinician portal, which has all this great stuff just for clinicians, but then you can see everything we have for parents. Um, you'll get an email twice a month from me telling you about what's new on the platform. Um, the platform is available 24 seven. It's educational for families to empower and equip and orient them. First and foremost, it is for parents. Um, it reduces the isolation they feel. It helps them hear from parents like them to get perspective and hear, um, to, number one, feel that they see that they are not alone, but also by listening to others, find their own way about what feels right and doesn't feel right for them. Um, you know, a big one is decision making around interventions like tracheostomy and feeding tubes. Um, and Parents go on and they tell us, they watch all of our content of parents talking about decision-making around trach. And if we feature a family who says yes to an intervention, we feature a family who says no. So parents go on and they watch and in listening and watching, they're like, huh, that feels like me. No, that doesn't feel like me. And so by listening to others, they can begin to see what feels right for themselves without the burden in that moment of being, you know, prodded to what, what's right, what's right, what's right for your child. Like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I need time to think. I need, let me hear from parents like me. There's no, no one a parent trusts more than a parent like them. Um, we also have videos, I mean, uh, podcasts, the blog, professionally produced guides, lots and lots of guides um, uh, from everything from uh, tools to, well, tools to decision-making around tracheostomy. We have a guide on being prepared for the family meeting. These are materials that are written for parents that have been reviewed by um, clinicians. So you can trust that they are uh, a safe destination to send parents. Uh, and here's a picture of the clinician portal, which has materials for how to refer CPN to families and how to use CPN for um training and education. In our recent survey of clinicians who use Courageous Parents Network, the first way they use it is they refer CPN to families. Um, but the second is self-education, which I thought was really interesting. And third was they take you, they embed our content in um, training and you should feel free to do that um, or be in touch with me if you want the raw materials. Um, I will, I will show, I'm gonna show this. Last video. This is from a mom, uh, just to round out the good parent. This is from a mom, Nikki. She had two sons with mitochondrial disease. At the time of this interview, both of them were living. They are both now, um, they've both now died. Um, they were both in their teens. And I can I have met Nikki multiple times since her children have died. And I can tell you that she does have peace. I think the one thing that gives me solace, it's going to be huge for me, is I know Avery would not be here if it wasn't for me. And I finally own that. Avery shouldn't be alive. Avery has had so many chances that he should have been gone. And the decisions that I've made for Avery, I think have kept him where he is. And so I've done right by him. I've made decisions that are right for him. And I know that when he leaves me, and us as a family, I feel like he's gonna be he's like, like, mom, thank you. His body, he, his body won't work, it's, he's done. I don't know how he stays alive now, but I, I know it's the love that he gets. I just, it's a, it's a higher level. It's not 
anything mechanical. Yeah. I think it's really just out of love and he will leave me and us, us Janessa, I Isaiah, even the dog, dog, Rick, when it is time, when he feels like he's completed his mission, I guess. And I will have peace knowing that I've done everything that I can as his mom. So I won't, there won't be any guilt. It will just be just pure exactly. sadness, just pure exactly. sadness and missing him and trying to lead a life with that hole. One of the best things that a mom said, she had a son that died of Mito and she, I said, how do you go on? And she said, you know, I did this, my son for all those years and I'm okay. We miss him, but I'm okay. And I feel like that, I hope to be me, that I just know that I will be okay in terms of there will be no regrets. It will just be sadness and just my heart broken and missing, you know, him dearly true um which brings us to the conclusion this is uh this is the thing that really got me in that 2009 piece by dr Hines. her research parents of children who have died of cancer report that their sense of having been a good parent at the end of their child's life helps them to emotionally survive their experience in their child's loss and what more could you want for um if for a family than to be in a place of peace if their child cannot be saved, if the progression of illness cannot be beaten by all the power of your brains in modern medicine, then not only do you hope that the child has a peaceful death, sometimes that isn't possible, but you hope that the family's grief can be as clean and uncomplicated as possible. And everything that precedes their death is what informs their grief. And that is one of the greatest powers of palliative care and palliative informed care. You don't have to be trained in palliative care to provide the type of care that makes all the difference. This is me with my daughter right after we learned of her um, Tay-Sachs. And then below is me uh, on the day of her second birthday, which unbeknownst to us was four days before she died. And it is true. Uh, um, right after Cameron died, a friend gave us this poem by Robert from by Raymond Carver, Late Fragment. And uh, I, I just love it so much. I try to end almost every talk with this. Uh, did you get what you wanted from this life? Even so, I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. And if parents feel that their child knew they were beloved, 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 that I love my kid and my child knows they love them, it makes all the difference. And you get to do that with them, honor their love, privilege their love, foreground their love, align yourself with their love, and that will make all the difference. Thank you very much. And a special thank you to Barbara for this invitation, honestly. No, it was perfect. Okay. I didn't have to um, thank you, Blythe. It, we have waited four years. When I gave the invitation to Blythe, we thought it would be four months, but four years, and we're so grateful that you're here. And thank you. So we'll open it for questions and um, Ingrid will have the mic for the people in the room and then we'll switch to the iPad questions. Well, I thank you so much for an incredible talk and a teaching experience for all of us. I so much admire what you've done for parents and helping them through the, these tough issues. I'd like to ask you your thoughts on, a, on an issue that we often deal with as a palliative care team, where there's a disagreement, as you said, between the treating team and the parents. And it's often because it often occurs when the treating team has based on its knowledge of the disease and the child feel that this there's, there's really nothing more that could be yeah. done to help this child. Yeah. And what we're going to be doing is doing things to the child yeah. rather than for the child. And the parents still feel that based on what you said, which was love, want this child to continue to, to live. Mm -hmm. And um and I think the issue is not that we that we want to go against the parents, but some of the caregivers feel that their role is a child advocate. Yes, of course. And so there are both different views of what it is to advocate for your child. The yep. parent is advocating based both on what they feel is best for the yep. child and also what they feel is best for them. And yes, they don't dismount they're afraid them. of 
the yeah, grief and of what it might mean yeah. to let their child go. The the mom who said, "I want to be sure I've done everything I can," yeah. so so I can't not do it. And the the caregivers are not evil in the sense that no. they hate parents. No, of course, not. and they don't think they're awful yeah. parents. Yeah, but they're saying, "But we are child yeah. advocates." Yeah. So what we do almost always we absolutely su we support the parents and we try to help them give the family the time yep. to, to come to a different decision. Yep. But I don't negate the feelings of our caregivers because no. one, they're suffering. Take yeah. care of them, And two, they're watching suffering of that the they child. know is going to not yep. come to any good end. So how do we help? You're doing a great job helping the parents. How do we help the caregivers in that instance? The, the clinicians okay. in the team. Um, so that is the one of the toughest things that happens in your work um, because, because uh, and I, I've seen this myself, I've seen parents make decisions that I think are, that I would never make for my child. And I'm like, what are you doing? Um, but at the end of the day, I think you have to get out of the way because um, if, unless you think that the, that there's like deep, that there's deep suffering that is being inflicted. Um, I think the parents' wishes need to prevail, but time is your greatest ally because I do believe that with time, parents will see the suffering that the clinicians are seeing. And no parent wants their child to suffer. Like the, 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 the tipping point for a parent will be, and there's an article that I was referencing yesterday that I need to go find, research done in, I think, Denmark, that parents' decisions to let their child go will happen when they, when they decide that the suffering that their child is having outweighs their anticipated suffering of the grief after their child has died. So I, I think I think this is the spiritual part of the practice. It's not the technical part. It's not the it, it's not the training. I think it's just holding the space and waiting. I, I don't know what that looks like when things are very, very time sensitive. Um, but I, I, I this is the art of it. I, um, and for the clinicians who are suffering, I, of course, it's honoring that like this is impossibly difficult for you. Um, and you are trying to protect the child. You're doing a really good job, which is your job, which is to protect the child. But the child comes with parents and then they're they're the parents and they're trying to protect their child, too. So honoring the feelings and then try. And then I think just trying to help the clinicians understand that that is what the parental love in that moment is looking like and that they just have to sort of step behind and wait and 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 wait probably it's i know it's, it's a you're mm. what we do, but it's really a cost. it is at a cost but i there's no i don't think that there's no fix to this this is the this is what's brutal about serious illness in children is everybody's invested and nobody wants what's happening and there are not any easy answers. And sometimes the, 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 like the parental love for their child is everyone in here who's a parent knows it's like, it's just impossible. It's impossible to bound. You can't get your arms around it. So how can you control it in that moment? Um, I, I th it's what you all, it's just the, it's the, it's why you should all get paid a lot more money. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I, there's no way, there's no answer with that. Okay. Um, from Alan Schroeder, I really enjoyed hearing about the pivotal role your general pediatrician played in your story. Mm -hmm. Seems there are many emerging factors that are making it harder and harder for general pediatricians to play such a strong quarterback role, mm -hmm. time, lack of reimbursement, and mm -hmm. perhaps even the increasing emphasis on complex care and palliative care. Mm. Thoughts on how to ensure that the primary care provider can stay optimally involved mm. in these cases? Uh, I love that question. Um, 
Well, I think the first thought is that the primary care um, pediatrician ideally tries, wants to stay involved. We do hear stories of the primary care pediatrician that's basically politely kicking the child out of their practice because I, I don't do this. And um, that can be pretty traumatic for a parent, um, especially if there are siblings who are being seen by that um, pediatrician. I would like to see um, primary palliative care taught to primary care pediatricians. I, this It's not the, the, the stuff that our pediatrician did with us was not the pain and symptom management piece. He brought people in for that. It was the anticipatory guidance. It was conversations about goals of care. It was about um, uh, listening to us, respecting our wishes and helping us transition to end of life. Uh, I'm with the, the American Academy of Pediatrics. I love that they are, they, you know, they're behind trying to promote primary palliative care across all pediatric specialties, including primary care, because at the end of the day, palliative care is just good care. Like it's not, it's not a specialty it, it, um, until you get to the special, special parts of palliative care, which is symptom management and pain dosing and all this stuff where you certainly need, need the specialty. But communication, like that's what, that's what, I mean, let me just say that no patient or patient family cares or would differentiate between a palliative care specialist and a good oncologist or a good pulmonologist or a good neurologist. They, they expect that type of care from all of their doctors. They don't like, well, now we're going to have a difficult conversation. So we're going to bring in the palliative care team. What? No, no. Well, I want to do that work with you. Or why aren't you doing that work with me? I mean, even the family, the NICU family, like, why wasn't that happening? Why did, why did it take palliative care to come in and make that possible? That should not have happened. So, bit of, my horse is high. <laughs> or my soapbox, as I think, yes. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm David Mauser. I'm one of the uh, fairly new palliative care physicians here. And I just wanted to echo, um, this is just an absolutely wonderful talk. Um, an honor to hear you speak twice in two weeks. And um, the just one pearl that everybody can bring into their practice every single day, it is the best, best part of my job is that I get to tell every single family that I meet that they are good parents mm -hmm. to validate the love that they give their child and that they are good parents. It is one of the most impactful things that I do every single day. It it, it aligns us with the family. It creates the therapeutic alliance and it gives the family space to acknowledge and feel their emotions mm -hmm. um, to move care forward. And every parent loves to hear that they're a good parent. Yeah. So you can just make that a standard part of your practice and it will move mountains for these families. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that. Um, has the Courageous Parents Network expanded to address the needs of parent of parents with mental health issues? Parents with mental health issues or children with mental health issues? The needs of parents with mental oh, health issues. No. Um, however, what we do know is that the caregiver burden can, well, I don't know if these are parents who come into parenting with mental health issues or if it's that the caregiver burden leads to mental health issues. Um, certainly um, there are the burden of, for, for children living with medical complexity with uncertain timelines who um, in the lack of respite and home care and opportunity for relief for them and home care nursing, and PCAs and reimbursement and all the problems in our system now that make it very difficult for parents to care for their children at home without taking a toll on them, um, it leads to depression and distress. And we, we at CPN are working on developing caregiver resources for the caregiver that aren't like go meditate, go do yoga, you know, get a massage. Those are nice, but they aren't going to solve the problem. So um, we're working on some of that, but no, we don't address bigger now, things. There's now a clarification from the person who asked, oh. Neil, Nicole McKenzie, saying the children who have the mental health issues. Uh, no, 
No, okay. no, okay. Um, no. But that's uh, there could be, uh, you know, one there. There are lots of adjacencies here. You could create a courageous parents for parents of children with mental health issues, parents of children with autism, parents, adult children of people with Alzheimer's. Uh, like there are a lot of adjacencies, but right now we're sticking in the seriously ill, physically ill space, not mental health. Um, um, but maybe eventually, once we've cracked this one. From Shazine Suleiman, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. In your opinion, how can we make inclusive palliative care more accessible to all families, mm -hmm. especially those living at the margins. Mm -hmm. Working with immigrant, refugee, mm -hmm. and indigenous communities, I have mm -hmm. seen barriers to palliative care for parents at the margins. Mm -hmm. So um, I love that question and I don't have a good answer to it because I myself have not spent adequate time with families at the margins. And that is something that Courageous Parents Network has on our priority list now for the next few years is to interview and talk with parents of parents uh, in underserved populations, whatever that means. It means a lot of things in a lot of different ways. And clinicians who work with those populations to better understand what the issues and challenges are other than all the obvious ones and to try to develop um, resources that could help with that at a minimum feature the voices of parents at the margins with, you know, interview the interview parents at the margins. Um, so that's coming, that is work to be done. Um, what I do know is that the way we think about palliative care in the United States is not necessarily how people think about palliative care in other countries. And Courageous Parents Network is very America focused. It's, you know, it's what I learned. It's what I benefited from. It's how, it's what my child received. Um, and I, it's, I have no doubt that it's not for everyone. So for CPN to be properly inclusive, we have work to do to explore what those things are for other people from other cultures. This is going to take a little while. A question from Linda Ritter. Yes. Hi, Linda. So, yeah. Uh, uh, financial toxicity part of an ongoing problem for these families. Yeah. No matter what the outcome is, are we going financial yeah. toxicity playing a role in? Uh, yeah. Does any of that at all? Is the question? Oh, yes. The finance, does Courageous Parents Network uh, address the financial burden and toxicity of? what caring for seriously ill children involved leads to. That's what, that's what you're asking about. Um, not really. We say it exists. We acknowledge it. We validate the difficulty of it. But we ourselves don't have any resources to address this problem. Um, and uh, we, we, you know, we have resources to help parents do financial planning, but that assumes that you're in a position to do financial planning. Um, so for the families who, you know, if there are two parents, one of them has to stop their job to take care. We talk about that that is one of the realities, but we don't offer any solutions because I don't know what the solutions are. That's, we don't offer, we talk about it, but we don't offer anything. Courageous Parents a, Network does so much that we expect that it does everything. Well, and more. And more. <laughs> I wish, I mean, we could, yeah. I think in my next incarnation, which will be after I leave CPN, there's a lot of advocacy that I'll be doing. Um, and actually there are, I mean, the, the advocacy that parents are doing in their states, which is where all of this has to happen, um, is is extraordinary, and the AAP has a really strong advocacy arm, and the, the 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 so there's a lot of advocacy happening, and parents love to advocate. CPN right now isn't in that space, but maybe I will be. So thank yeah. you, Glenn. Okay, I was just going to say one closing thing. So first of all, that was extraordinary, and I think will motivate i think part of the legacy will be people that will move it into some of these other areas with this example uh, the other thing i wanted to say is we're going to make sure this video is shared i've already started sending links to our chief nursing officer our office of patient experience i think that our entire community 
far beyond the sort of routine pediatric grand rounds attendees will benefit as well our patients immeasurably from this really quite extraordinary hour. We've never gone over by 15 minutes before, but it was worth every minute. So I just want to thank you for joining us and a special thanks to Barb and Harvey for bringing you here and to the Bannerfirm family that has made this all possible. So thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.